Hi, everyone. My name is Neil Littman. I'm the founder and CEO of Biovert. And uh, today we are here with Harold Ott, who is the founder and chairman of Iviva Medical. Uh, Harold is a thoracic surgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital, an associate professor in surgery at Harvard Medical School, uh, where he built one of the leading laboratory groups in or organ engineering and um, reconstitution and regeneration. Uh, IVIVA is developing uh, autologous tissue constructs as a solution to end-stage renal disease. And so we are thrilled to welcome Harold today. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Harold uh, to uh, introduce himself and IVIVA and share uh, some slides and the pitch deck. So Harold, I will turn it over to you. Well, Neil, thank you very much for uh, having me and for allowing us to present uh, our slides today. I'm excited to share the details on our project with you and uh, hopefully convince you that this is the next logical step that medicine will take to improve our lives. So with that, I'm going to uh, start slide sharing. Um, let's see. Can you see this? Yes. I can, yep. Perfect. So, um, you know, our, our company um, uh, uh, is, a, is a biotech startup that uh, spun out of Massachusetts General Hospital uh, a few years back. And uh, our long-term goal is really to develop uh, soft manufacturing techniques to address one of the key um, hurdles that we face in medicine today, uh, you know, one of the last frontiers and an ever-growing need, um, and that is really end organ failure. So as we all uh, live longer, luckily, and our medicine, medicine gets better at surviving, uh, helping us to survive acute diseases, uh, you know, luckily today, if you have pneumonia or even if you have a heart attack, um, your, our medical system is geared towards getting you through this and making you survive um, these acute events or acute conditions. What that leads to is really a global epidemic in end-stage organ disease. So uh, as you walk away from a heart attack that you managed to survive or from pneumonia or most recently from COVID, for example, uh, you have suffered damage that we're able to, to a certain extent, reverse. But over the life, over the course of your life, you accumulate damage and eventually you suffer. Many of us suffer from what's called end-stage organ disease or organ failure. And in all reality, the likelihood for, for any one of us to suffer from single system organ failure is roughly 20%. So one in five will suffer from, through the course of their life, from renal failure or heart failure or end stage lung disease. And if you look at these numbers uh, globally, there's many million patients suffering from end stage renal disease, from renal, renal failure, heart failure, and respiratory disease. One way to solve this is transplantation and organ transplantation and uh, tremendous uh, efforts go into this. Um, at the same time, we've learned uh, many very valuable lessons from uh, organ transplantation. The problem is that in all reality, the numbers don't match up. So while you have um, several hundred thousand people on hemodialysis, over three and a half million globally, you really only have so many organs for transplantation to go around. And especially as uh, technologies evolve that prevent injuries, self-driving cars and intelligent restraint systems. And as our care of acute diseases improves, the number of donor organs will actually decrease rather than increase. And so the availability of, of biologic organ replacement and transplantation will, will is anticipated, if anything, to decrease. So um, the one, one of the leading or one of the major fields uh, in end-stage organ disease that affects most people is end-stage renal disease, interestingly. And if you look at outside of transplantation, how we treat these patients uh, is that we, we uh, luckily have technologies and methods to replace some organ systems. So in the case of end-stage uh, renal disease and kidney failure, uh, hemodialysis has really, really revolutionized the care of patients. It enables survival. But then if you look at uh, how this technology has evolved over the last, um, let's say, 
uh, 40, 50 years, not much, or 60 years, not much has changed. In the sense that in the 1960s, you were in a bed attached to a pumping system and cannulas in the machine. And today, that's still the same reality. If you're a hemodialysis patient three times a week, um, you're sitting in a, in, a, in a hospital bed or in a bed at home attached to a machine that pumps blood into a filter and, uh, and cleans your blood of the toxins. If you talk to patients, the quality of life on that treatment is quite poor. Uh, you know, you feel somewhat okay the day after hemodialysis, the day before hemodialysis, your fluid overloaded, and uh, the day off hemodialysis, you're tired and wiped out because uh, the treatment takes so much volume off. It's a very expensive treatment, so it uh, costs about eighty to one hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so, for many healthcare systems, is actually the single most expensive treatment uh, offered to their population, and it has an annual mortality of up to twenty five percent. So if you put that into context, you know, having being on hemodialysis is just as bad as having uh, cancer of sorts in terms of your long-term outcome. Um, it, uh, the, the, the burden that adds to all of that is that for many patients, it's a destination therapy. Like I said, you know, of 100,000 patients on hemodialysis, uh, there's really only 20,000 transplants done and many patients are not candidates for transplantation for one reason or the other. So what would be a new solution to this old problem? Um, a new solution, and that's this part taken from a survey that the ASN and XPRIZE had done several years back, uh, asking patients on hemodialysis what they would want. Um, a perfect solution to this problem would be a fully implantable biologic device. Uh, you know, in all reality, patients want non-tethered form of treatments. They want no external vascular access. And they want no dialysate. A dialysate or an absorbent required. And that's also because being on dialysis requires a tremendous amount of infrastructure and a tremendous amount of clean water. Um, somewhat a surprising technical detail, I think, for people. But if you, if you run a dialysis machine, you need lots and lots of clean water to run through the filters. And patients want improved quality of life and survival. So they want to get away from this fact that you know, they are tethered to a machine um, through, through needles, but really not feel well for the majority of their time. You know, I've been focusing on organ engineering for a long time and, and the lessons we took away from, from how our organs and our body work are really that most of our biologic function are fulfilled by cells, but cells can only fulfill these functions if they're in an adequate three-dimensional context. So it takes both cells and extracellular matrix, sort of the, the binding substance between cells to uh, enable higher level functions such as gas exchange, or in the case of kidney, uh, toxin excretion and fluid excretion. If you then look closer at the functional units in these organs, and what you see here in this picture is an electron micrograph of a uh, glomerulus. So this is a, a ball, a cross section of a little ball that's um, several hundred micrometers in diameter. And as you can see here, there's little capillaries in that ball through which blood gets squeezed and the filtrate, uh, the primary urine gets generated as fluid trickles through that basement membranes, through this filter membrane. So if you look at these organs in our body, a basement membrane is a core architectural component of many of our organs. A basement membrane is a micro scale structure in a macro scale context. So there's a fancy way to say that there's a lot of it, that it's very thin and that there's a lot of it. So, uh, you know, people always quote that the lung has a surface area of a third of a tennis cord, or same applies to the kidneys. So we really have um, a very large surface area of basement membranes uh, packed in a way that our heart is able to deliver a lot of blood or perfuse a lot of blood right over it and uh, that cells can grow on this basement membrane. If you look at current technologies in, in additive manufacturing or tissue engineering, we, we don't have the techniques to replicate that. So making a very large surface um, of a very thin biologic material uh, that is mechanically stable and strong enough to sustain perfusion and cell adhesion and gets packaged up in a size compatible manner, such as the size of a kidney or a human organ, is very hard to accomplish with current technologies. And that's where we and the team of Iviva identified a gap, a knowledge gap and a technology gap. 
we were able to bridge this gap by developing a technique that we call thin film interposition. So instead of going about to try to let cells grow the entire organ by themselves, or try to uh, 3D print or manufacture the scaffold of the organ um, uh, using conventional technique, we said, why don't we start with the basement membrane itself? And so we use technology, spin coating technology that's widely available to make a biologic equivalent of a basement membrane. We use extracellular matrix proteins and porogens to spin an extracellular matrix um, based construct, a membrane that can provide a very similar backbone to an organ um, as, the, as, as, in as it is in native human tissue. Now then the next problem was to develop a technology to deliver blood and have a removal system on the other side. So a hierarchical channel system that enables us to deliver blood to that basement membrane and to the cells living on the basement membrane. And for that, we use conventional extrusion printing. As you can see here, we, we print vascular patterns onto our basement membrane, onto both sides of our basement membrane, and then incorporate this into a three-dimensional hydrogel. So here you can see a cross section where uh, a, a thin film is, is generated at first, and then the sacrificial pattern of a material that will be removed is 3D printed on both sides of this basement membrane. Then this, this construct gets embedded into a three-dimensional, into a hydrogel, and the, sacrificial, and the sacrificial material is leached out or removed. What that leaves us with is basically a void a system of, of empty spaces uh, uh, of channels on both sides of the basement membrane. This can then be repopulated with cells that function very similar to the slide I showed you before that uh, basement, the convoluted basement membrane in the renal glomerulus. So there's endothelial cells that line the blood vessels and epithelial cells that line the urinary space that enable us to, to achieve solute exchange and filtration function. Um, this is, these are some sort of real world examples. You can see this is a, a view of this membrane where you can see two different patterns printed onto this membrane. Um, this here is roughly a millimeter long. And you can see these channels on one side, and then there's a corresponding channel system on the other side of the membrane. This then gets embedded into a hydrogel, as you can see here, with vascular conduits attached to it, through which ultimately cells can be seeded and blood can be perfused. As you can see here, um, uh, the, there is basically blood flowing, one through, blood flowing through one channel system, and in this case, actually air flowing to the other channel system to test, ga to test gas exchange. Um, how do we turn this now into a kidney? So we basically borrow our architecture from the native kidney. This is the functional unit of the native kidney. It's called a nephron. And it's a very, very uh, sophisticated uh, system that's very adaptive in the human body. So there's the, the first part is called the glomerulus. And here's where the primary urine is created. And the urine flows in the human kidney through the loop of Henle, which then modifies the urine. So it concentrates it. And depending on whether you're standing on the Sahara or in the tropical uh, rainforest, it will allow you to concentrate the urine so you lose very little water or it will allow you to make or produce mostly water to basically get rid of volume, at the same time get rid of um, uh, toxins and regulate your electrolyte concentrations. Now this, to rebuild this, is way beyond of what is actually necessary for survival. And to remind you, hemodialysis only replaces very few functions of this. So our goal is not to replicate, replicate the entire complexity of the kidney, but really to, to replicate something in between hemodialysis and what our kidney does. So our architecture will, will borrow from this, but simplify it in the sense that we have a first um, segment that generates a filtrate and that is seeded with, um, uh, with um, glomerular epithelial cells. And then a second segment that enables us to refine the primary urine that's generated. How do we create, how do we turn this layer then into a human kidney, a scalable device? That is by layering our technology so that um, each layer that produces a finery, final urine uh, stacks on the next layer, on the next layer, on the next layer to ultimately achieve a device that can, um, sufficient, uh, can provide sufficient toxin removal and water removal to get somebody off hemodialysis. 
So our sort of benchmarks are um, to produce, uh, to clear roughly 15 millimeters per minute uh, in terms of ultrafiltration of blood and to produce roughly half a cc of urine, um, uh, of urine per minute to get somebody uh, off the need of, of hemodialysis. Now, what we've accomplished so far, this is a 2000, what we've done up to uh, end of 2019, um, we've produced many, many membranes. And the reason why I show these numbers is to show this is not some concept where manufacturing needs and, and the actual need to make a device don't match up. This is, since we use relatively simple technology and simple materials, we were able to make a lot of these devices in our R&D work, even with a very small team. You know, we manufactured 170 kidney scaffolds, pancreas scaffolds and lung scaffolds as we broadened the platform. Um, we produced 850 vascular conduits, seeded, um, seeded many of these scaffolds with cells and um, performed a total of 200 days of cumulative device culture. So um, this is a scalable technology that even with a small team can, be, can be reproduced and improved upon very quickly. The other thing is, as you see here on the bottom, is we, we isolate our cells from discarded kidneys from, uh, that are not used for transplantation. And so our team has, well, at this point, um, received well over 60 human kidneys that we use to isolate the cells to enable function of this device from. This is a resource that's currently not used in the United States for anything. About 5,000 kidneys are discarded every year. And so for our first generation device, we will use those cells to build um, the first clinical devices. Um, this is uh, sort of an important milestone and we achieved to show the scalability of this device to a large animal experiment. Um, so we, this is a two layer, two leaflet device where you can see a glomerular leaflet and a tubular leaflet uh, in two layers that's now attached in an extracorporeal fashion through cannulas to um, a large animal recipient. Uh, and we can see here a filtrate being produced, as you can see here. Um, this is what the device looks like. So it's a, it's a soft device. It's not a piece of plastic, but it's actually um, made out of extracellular matrix material that is biocompatible and can be, uh, can be handled and implanted, very similar to a donor organ. Um, and then in this case, you can see it was successfully anastomosed to the abdominal aorta and the vena cava off, um, off a large animal, of a pig and is being perfused by, by the recipient and produces a filtrate. Now, this was very early proof of principle. This is not the final design. And of course, it's not at full scale, but it drives a couple of very important points home. So this device is not made out of plastic or unnatural materials or synthetic materials, and therefore does not suffer from the same um, shortcomings as uh, synthetic devices, or if you look at, for example, left ventricular assist devices suffer from where whenever you have a foreign material in touch with human blood, you have clotting, you have um, obstruction, infl an inflammatory reaction, and eventually occlusion of the device, or consequences from clot that leaves the device, such as in the, as in the uh, ventricular assist devices, embolism or, or strokes. The other thing is that it's important to note that in this device, there's no pump involved, right? So the resistance of the device is so low that it can be perfused by the recipient's vascular system very similar to a donor organ and does not require energy supply, maintenance um, of mechanical pumps, and does not have the, the downsides that mechanical pumps inevitably come with that if they are, if they are in touch with human blood and, and, and are of small scale, um, there's hemolysis and an inflammatory reaction just because of the fact that there's an, a, a high speed spinning mechanical rotor uh, in contact with the human blood. So, so, and from a medical device, these are very important points. For example, with left ventricular assist devices that require a, an energy source or so cable going through the skin, many, many patients um, eventually succumb to cable, to driveline infections, even though that seems like such a trivial issue. So. So having a permanent synthetic implant that requires a battery or requires energy source um, is, uh, to function is a major hurdle that we would overcome with this device design. So here is our uh, R&D path uh, and our trajectory towards uh, clinical implant or clinical um, approval. We had a, a, a prototype, um, as you saw here in the large animal tested for about 30 minutes. Our plan is to with the next um, um, uh, funding round, uh, fueled by the next funding round to get to a wearable device. 
that um, can be used in, um, uh, in post-transplant patients that experience delayed graft function. This will be a very similar device, device to an implant, but it will provide us with a much clearer regulatory pathway. So as you can imagine, uh, developing a biologic device for organ replacement is something quite novel and uh, will be, um, I think, um, complex for the FDA to regulate. Um, making that on top of everything else, a fully implanted, permanent implant um, will, even, um, will, will make it an even more complex path. And so in order to de-risk both the regulatory pathway and the device development, we decided in response to advice also from our scientific advisory board meeting, meetings to, um, to uh, make our first device a wearable device that takes advantage of the fact that patients have um, vascular access and that they're immunosuppressed because of their transplantation um, to bridge that early phase of graft dysfunction that can happen as, as often as in, or as in as many as 50% of kidney transplant patients. Now with clinical data from that device in hand, our plan is to then perform or, or develop an implant, a first generation implant that is allogeneic. So meaning derived from donor cells of, uh, of discarded kidney donors. Um, and then ultimately, of course, drive our technology to a point where we can um, use either uh, universal donor cells or patient derived cells to overcome the need for immunosuppression. Um, this is our team. So our team is led by um, Brock Reeve, our CEO. He's also the executive director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. You know, Brock and I have known each other for over 10 years and in his function at, as the head of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, he funded very early lab in, in every very early lab work in my lab at MGH. Um, myself, you know, I'm a thoracic surgeon as um, you had mentioned and, um, and uh, have an interest in organ engineering. Uh, Charles Klass is the VP of engineering. Um, he uh, has an, a master's in uh, science from in biomedical engineering from Johns Hopkins and is the one who developed our scaffold technology. And then Dan Cheng is, uh, is part of our engineering team. He has expertise in engineering of vascular structures, of perfused structures. That's where he did his PhD at Boston University, joined us a couple of years ago. Tom Gallegos is um, a cell biologist with a developmental biology background in kidney development, um, worked with Ian Drummond for many years at MGH, and uh, we're excited that he joined us several years ago. And uh, Susan Nelson and Gita Key are um, our, our uh, technologists, senior research associates that help us with cell culture assays and, uh, and um, uh, functional assessments and histologic assessments of our grafts. Um, this is our scientific advisory board. Uh, so we have a, a small but fully engaged scientific advisory board. Lou Alvarez um, is a West Point um, professor, MIT grad uh, who runs uh, organ manufacturing, uh, organ engineering uh, for United Therapeutics. Um, David Klassen happens to be Charles Klassen's dad and is a nephrologist and the chief medical officer of the United Network for Organ Sharing, which is the over supervising um, body that uh, basically organizes and administers all organ transplants in the US. Jim Markman is the chief of transplant at MGH and is an expert both in kidney transplant um, and, um, uh, and pancreas, um, pancreas, eyelid isolation, pancreas transplant and eyelid transplant. Andy McMahon is a very well-respected uh, kidney cell biologist um, uh, at University of Southern California and uh, helps us with understanding the cell phenotypes that we need and identify our targets. And Dave Mooney is a well-respected um, um, uh, expert in the field of cell matrix interaction, tissue engineering, uh, and the Harvard professor. Um, this is our intellectual property. So iViva owns its intellectual property. The thin film interposition was, um, was developed in iViva and is owned by iViva. We filed on cell enhanced peritoneal dialysis on biologic blood purification or fu fluid purification with biocompatible membranes. And we're in the process of filing more IP on our vascular conduits that we developed um, and the cell delivery system. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Harold. That was, uh, that was great. Um, a couple questions uh, that came to mind as you're going through uh, some of the information. The, the, the first question that comes to mind actually is with the, the current prototype device, 
Do you imagine that that size device is sufficient for the necessary filtration in certainly in a large animal, but even in, in humans, or would you anticipate requiring more than one device to adequately uh, filter the, the blood su supply in, in a human? No, that's a great question, Neil. So, so with that device, we just wanted to show scalability, basically. Our goal is in the next two years to get to a 10-layer device um, that we anticipate will probably be roughly at half the scale of what a human um, or what a patient would need. We believe that it's still um, sufficient to show large animal function, number one, uh, and, and number two, approach the FDA for an interact meeting, which is our next big milestone. So this is the formerly known as pre-pre-IND pre meeting, at what point you at which point you basically show the FDA what you have, that you have a promising technology, and, um, and at the same time receive feedback as to what preclinical data would be required for approval. So the current device is not at human scale. It merely shows scalability. The device that we're planning to build in the next two years will be not at full human scale, but very close to that. And ultimately it will probably require something more in the 30 layer range. Mm -hmm. So Harold, you, you had mentioned your next major milestone. Um, could, could you talk about some of the, some of the major challenges um, that you need to overcome to hit that next major milestone? No, absolutely. So major challenges were to really develop, and that's where I think one of the key values in, in the company is to develop soft manufacturing skills uh, that allow us to work with biologic materials and cells to create a three-dimensional device um, that can sustain blood perfusion. So we don't have the luxury to have a pump that drives blood into our device. So we need to live within the, within the physiologic parameters that the human cardiovascular system gives us in terms of what can the human heart work against? What's the normal blood pressure? And what's also the blood pressure range that a medical device would see after implantation? Um, we have to develop techniques to manufacture using materials that are um, not mechanically stable. So 3D printing or photopolymerizing or, or, or manufacturing a, a device that's mechanically stable of human scale with thin membranes out of titanium would probably be much easier, right? Because of the inherent mechanical properties of the material. In our case, we work with extracellular matrix proteins that have to be, um, you know, our product has to be thin enough to enable solute exchange and strong enough at the same time to sustain blood perfusion, but it cannot contain foreign material because then we're back to basically square one. You know, yes, we can make this as out of PDMS or, or silicone, but and we have the same problem as many other devices that we have a foreign material that the blood interacts with rather than with cells. Um, and then one, one of the big hurdles that we, I think, quite successfully tackled was the vascular conduit questions. Uh, you know, that in itself is um, a medical device development that's required. We, we need to basically find materials that blend with our scaffold materials well, that bond to our scaffold materials, but without the use of, of any sort of metacrylation or plastic plastification. So any, any synthetic material we try to avoid in this process to maintain that sort of um, original plan to build physiologic tissue. So these are just a few examples of hurdles that we've overcome. Now, scaling up to the, to the level um, needed in the next two years is a hurdle that we are excited to take and tackle, but something that we yet have to do to, um, to basically bring our technology to the next level. And then Harold, if I think about sort of the target product profile of your long-term scientific vision, right, it sounds like that is a, a fully implantable artificial organ. Um, but on, on the timeline slide, uh, you nicely show different incremental steps to reach that point, including uh, a, a, an organ that's worn uh, externally, for example, um, that looks like it's encased in sort of a, a sleeve uh, or, or wrapping around the outside of the body. Um, it looked like you had multiple points of IND filings. Could you just maybe talk a little bit about your path to commercialization? You know, wh which, which, um, which types you'll be able to actually commercialize in the pursuit of that fully implantable artificial organ? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. So, so the first, maybe the, um, the, the rationale for it is to de-risk the process, really. Uh, and and uh, that came simply from the fact that in, in prior conversations with the FDA, 
you know, the answer was, well, you tell me if it's safe or not, right? And so, so thinking of a regulatory pathway where we get clinical data from an extracorporeal device as a surgeon sounds just very attractive because the failure modes are very, very easily controllable. Uh, from a commercial perspective, there is a need for renal replacement therapy in those patients that do not have immediate graft function after renal transplantation. And especially as the transplant field um, ventures into marginal donors. So this is actually a highly predictable event, delayed graft function in kidney transplantation, and it's predictable based on donor criteria. So if you have the optimal, if you have a twin brother who's in the OR next door and who donates his kidney to, to you as a patient, um, your likelihood of developing immediate graft or, or delayed graft function is practically zero. That kid, the kidney has basically no ischemia time there's no transport time. It gets handed from one hand, from one surgeon to the other surgeon, gets implanted and will function right away because the kidney doesn't, barely notices that it changed uh, recipients or it changed, um, changed bodies. Uh, many organs, unfortunately, are not like that. You know, many, many uh, donor organs are uh, transported over long periods of time, have long ischemia time, and especially as we try to increase transplant numbers are what's called marginal donors. So they they are known to have risk factors, they are known to have underlying disease, and they have long ischemia time. In those patients, the, the likelihood of delayed graft function is relatively high, and um, as I said, can be predicted, and poses some important challenges for the immediate post-operative period. You know, now you have a patient who just underwent the kidney transplantation, and they um, suffer from delayed graft function. So they need hemodialysis and they're difficult to manage because you need to, on the one hand, start them in immunosuppression. They just had surgery and now you have to hemodialyze them, uh, which has implications on the cardiovascular system. You remove fluid from their body. It's a stress factor that further could further damage the actual donor organ that's not functioning very well yet. And so um, delayed graft function therefore becomes a predictor of long-term outcome. So these patients have worse long-term outcomes. And of course, it's very hard to dissect out. Is it because they, their donor organ was not as good or is it because the, the injury that the additional injury that the donor organ sustained around the surgery? So th this is um, what we believe a commercially valid product um, that will be available to post-transplant patients. Um, these are of course, a relatively small number of patients in the bigger scheme of things, but a way for us to develop a, a commercially viable product um, with a very low risk regulatory pathway and a way for us to learn very, very important lessons from early clinical data. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna ask in terms of the, the timeline to get to the person human clinical data, can you remind us about when you think you might actually be in the clinic? Yeah, so our, our hope is to basically in the next two years get to the interact meeting and then an additional year to fulfill the requirements of the FDA to, um, to, to perform the preclinical experiments that they would see in a controlled fashion. So at the earliest, it would be basically three years down the road or three and a half years down the road that we, we would enter phase one clinical trial. Great, okay, thank you. Um, one question that I always like to ask, which, which you touched on uh, when you were going over the team slide, um, could you just describe a little bit how you assembled uh, your founding team, advisory team, how you all decided uh, that this is the problem that you all wanted to, to collectively work on and, and tackle? No, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm very much a believer in organic growth. And I think that um, building research teams Highly innovative research teams is a very, very difficult thing to do, um, and and fostering sort of that um, innovative culture in a, in an early stage company, I think, is is obviously one one of my major responsibilities and and a difficult challenge. The company has grown a challenge that Iviva actually I think manages very well. Uh, the company has grown very naturally. So so Brock and I, like I said, have known each other for many years. Brock is very well respected in the regenerative medicine community. And he's a fantastic leader, and and he 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 combines both um, knowledge on in his consulting experience, and combines both knowledge on the business side as well as a deep deep understanding of the science behind regenerative medicine products and cell cell based products. Um, Brock has mentored me over a decade in his function at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, 
and like I mentioned earlier, you know, enabled some of the early work in cardiac regeneration that we had done. And so we've known each other for a very long time. And so when the time came to raise a seed round for IVIVA in 2018, um, Brock, about which I was very excited, Brock, Brock uh, decided to join, join the team, basically join forces and, and really help us, was instrumental in raising that seed round and enabling the next step uh, to, to hire a team and get going. Um, Charlie and 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 uh, Charlie has has worked with me for almost five years now. Charles Classen, uh, you know, he did his master's at uh, Johns Hopkins, and uh, I him and I started to work together because he worked with a liver transplant surgeon that I had I had worked with, so uh, came highly or well well recommended um, by uh, a person that I had worked with for many years, uh, working on liver regeneration. So he has a longstanding experience with an engineering background. And as you, as you can tell, our company um, blends or requires skills both on the cell biology as well as on the material science and engineering side, which is, uh, I think, relatively, still relatively unique. You know, there's a lot of tissue engineers with very strong engineering backgrounds, but less cell biology background, or there's a lot of cell biologists, developmental biologists, which bring that to the table, but not necessarily to combine skills. So um, Charlie has, has both, as do many other team members. So that was a great match. Um, they, uh, Dan is, um, is an, an engineer with a very specific uh, skill set. You know, more and more people are doing 3D printing with the goal of, of engineering uh, transplantable tissues. Um, but if you look, and that's uh, the recent NASA challenge is actually evidence to that, that the capability to generate vascularized tissue is still fairly, fairly novel. And so Dan's project was on sugar printing and generation of perfusible scaffolds. So again, very unique skill set to combine the, the engineering background with the cell biology background to make living transplants. Tom, the cell biologist, is, um, uh, has a background in kidney development and kidney cell biology, which is key as we try to not only seed one cell type, but multiple cell types and try to develop technologies to isolate these cells from donor organs. So, so as you can tell, the you know the the more senior part of the team is is very well tuned to uh, what we try to do uh, in the company and um, has been selected carefully and sort of self-selected to our project more than anything. And Susan um, and Gita both come from backgrounds that are extremely valuable to the company. Susan has a bio has worked for bioengineering in the bioengineering industry, even though she's very young, bioengineering industry before, and has. Um, experience both in lab management as well as maintenance of different various cell lines and, um, and therefore very valuable skills in, in helping us to really manufacture a clinical device. Um, and, and Gita's background is actually in pharmacology and she's worked uh, in tissue engineering labs so with Ali Kadem Mosseini and others in town. So has a very material heavy and chemistry heavy background which is extremely valuable as we have to fine tune our extracellular matrix. So, so the team so far is highly specialized in what we try to do. Our plan is to grow that team to, um, to, um, to enable the work over the next two years by roughly three to four people. Great, thank you, Harold. Um, so it's fascinating to hear how, how teams come together. Um, one final question for you. Um, if you sort of fast forward, let's say five or 10 years in the future, how do you, envision uh, your technology uh, being utilized, really impacting uh, the lives of, of patients and, and sort of changing the face of, of, of care. Yeah, that, no, that, that sort of the, the long-term vision of our, of our group is to, to be able to find a solution for an unmet need right now, really. And that, that's what, um, you know, as a surgeon and, and uh, a person with a clinical practice taking care of patients every day, I very much have the finger on the pulse and see the need um, for treatments for end organ failure. You know, if you take care of a patient with, um, with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, you realize what burden that is and, and how much it every year takes away from your lifespan, uh, really. And so, so for me personally and for our group, I think our goal is to address that need and help many, many patients by, by developing novel treat, forms of treatment um, for end-stage renal disease as a first step. But as you can tell, you know, our technology is somewhat a platform technology. 
So all of us hope that this can be applied to help the millions of patients suffering from end-stage lung disease and other diseases. So the long-term vision is here really to, to be the first company that um, develops a clinically uh, applicable biologic device that replaces organ function and ultimately can be applied to millions of patients worldwide to improve their lives. Great. Well, thank you, Harold. With that, I think we will uh, close the, the presentation and q and I'd like to thank you very much for spending time with us, uh, sharing the Aviva medical story. I think it's fascinating, uh, fascinating science, fascinating approach, uh, definitely, as you mentioned, an unmet medical need uh, and really has the long-term potential to, to really sort of revolutionize patient care in the future. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we will sign off now. And for those who are interested in learning more, you can visit www.biobridge.com. Thank you. Neil, thank you very much.